So good night, welcome everybody. I'm happy to, to talk and to present Professor Ambar Saik. Uh, Professor Saik was born in Pakistan two years before the partition of India. He currently, he currently works on the economics department of the new School for Social Science. <coughs> He's working on an alternative approach to competition and microdynamics. He has been mentored by uh, the main economist Adolf Loth and Robert Hilgroner. Uh, Amberg is a very prolific uh, scholar. He has like a nice and books and articles. He coordinated uh, the book Globalization and the Myth of Free Trade in Rutledge. And he published a book translated into Spanish, actually, called Teoría del Comercio Internacional published with Maya, which I strongly recommend and which uh, goes very in hand with some of the arguments that Han Jun Chang made in the previous day. Uh, he is the author of Capitalism, Competitions, Conflict, Crisis, a book in which he has been working on since the last 40 years and that will be published very recently in Spain, in, in, in Spanish by Fondo de Cultura Económica in Mexico. Uh, they have been very nice sharing the cover with us and where we'll show it. And um, for briefly describing the work of Ambar, he's the first economist to successfully interpret uh, classical authors, Marx, Smith, Ricardo, and Ken Keynes, and situate them in a wider theory to describe the structural features of the capitalist system. According to his understanding, the search for long-term profitability is the ultimate goal of business firms, and this occurs due to an intense competition in the global market. So short and long-term profitability is an element subject to what he calls turbulent regulation through errors and adjustments in supply, its production, and demand, consumption. Uh, Syke portrays capitalism as a kind of chaos, he points out dragging from the neoclassical theory with some order inside, he adds, making it from the post Keynesian theory. That is the process resulting from reducing a wide variety of economic variables, commodity prices, wage or profit rates, to a series of principles or centers of gravity in constant, mov in constant movement. For Syke, real competition is the central regulatory mechanism of capitalism. And <laughs> a phrase that I really like, uh, real competition is as different from the so-called perfect competition as what is from Malet. Welcome, Ambar. Thanks for being here, and the stage is yours right now. Thank you, guys. I'm very uh, honored to be part of this conference, and uh, I will try my best to make an argument which uh, I think is different from others because I'm not focusing on specific topics, though I have many topics in my book, but rather about a general framework. Um, uh, if I can show my PowerPoint, I can begin there. Should I share my screen now? You should. Under. Share it? Let me try. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, let me first tell you that, that what I'm trying to argue here is to develop a general framework. Now, at a general framework, I don't mean just sort of statements of how capitalism works and abstract. And I want to show you that you can go from specific theoretical arguments to the empirical. And this, in my opinion, is exactly what uh, Smith did, what Ricardo did, and what Marx planned to do. But we know that Marx did not finish his work. And I'll come back to that if you want to talk about it, uh, which is a, tr a tremendous pity because he's probably the best economist of the understanding of capitalism. Uh, and of course, Keynes who introduced the idea of macroeconomics as a separate discipline. And even though you can find elements of that in Marx, you can pretty much find every element in Marx, but unfortunately it's scattered over many documents over many years. So this is my book, uh, came out in 2016. It's called Capitalism Conflict Crises. And this is the Turkish edition, which came out several years ago. Uh, and this is the Chinese edition. 
the Chinese edition just came out and the book was awarded the 2021 Yikai J.P. Morgan Prize for the financial book of the year which I must say has come of a big surprise because unfortunately, heterodox economists don't really read my book, but it turns out that the capitalist class is reading my book. So there is some uh, reference or some appreciation of it. And this is the uh, uh, Spanish edition come out, coming out from Fondo de Cultura Economica, uh, and it's uh, due shortly. This is the cover. It's a lovely cover. Uh, let me go from there to talk about the basic themes of the book. First of all, the themes in economics are very common. Common says that there's some kind of equilibrium. And I want to argue that there is no such thing as equilibrium. There is an equilibration process in many, many domains but these are dynamic in the sense that the center of gravity is always moving. They're turbulent in the sense that things are always fluctuating. So there is no such thing as equilibrium, short run, long run, anything like that. It's not wrong to analyze the properties of those centers of gravity, but equilibriums are centers of gravity of a very dynamic and turbulent process. In the same vein, I try and point out that you can develop a complete equivalent of neoclassical theory of consumers, but instead it can be developed on the basis of heterogeneous agents acting in socially acculturated manners. That is the manners that depend on their class, their uh, country, their language. And this is important because we need to explain consumer behavior, but we should not explain it in the absurd manner that orthodox economics does of perfect competition, perfect knowledge, totally greedy uh, individuals, and so on. I'd be happy to talk more about that, a critique of utility functions and all of that. I'm highly critical and also game theory. Now, the other side of that is business behavior. And here, the important point is business behavior is driven by a desire for profit, more profit, ever increasing profit. And this is a point that uh, the classical economists make. And as you see, this is also a point that Keynes makes. These two uh, micro foundations, so to speak, provide a foundation for aggregate demand, for theory of aggregate demand grounded in real competition in which investment is motivated by the net rate of return on investment. That is the difference between the rate of return and the rate of interest. Now, there's an obvious point in the business literature because as they point out, if they throw money into the market and their rate of return is only the interest rate, then they have failed because they could have stayed at home with their money in the bank. So they measure their degree of success by the degree over which the profit rate exceeds the interest rate. Now, this is Keynes's uh, difference between the excess of the marginal efficiency of capital over the interest rate. But it's very important and people don't understand that this is exactly Marx's argument also. And the reason you don't understand that is that it's buried in different aspects of volume three and people seldom read uh, Marx beyond volume one even though it was an intention of Marx to create a comprehensive and general framework for economics. He didn't do it. He didn't finish. He had a few other things to do in politics and uh, um, setting up the first international and operating. So I'm not criticizing Marx. I'm actually criticizing the Marxist tradition for not understanding this and uh, not following up. Now, an aspect of that <clears throat> for me is that if you don't have a theory of real competition, you end up with the theory of perfect competition. And if you end up with the theory of perfect competition, then real competition looks like monopoly. That is to say, it does not conform to perfect competition. And therefore, you, you see big firms and price setting by firms and all of that. And this has led the Marxist tradition to see capitalism as dominated by monopoly. But I argue that in fact, there is no evidence, so this is a strong argument, there's no evidence that bigger firms get higher profit rates. In fact, as I show in the literature from the business side, uh, the profit rates of bigger capitals are lower 
than the average profit rate of smaller capitals. But the difference is the death rate of sm smaller capitals is much higher than the death rate of bigger capital. So if you adjust for risk, there's not that there's not any difference between those. So I urge people who think of capitalism as monopoly capitalism to uh, open your mind to think about it, the idea that capitalism is in fact regulated in the same way that Smith, Ricardo, and Marx especially argued. Um, okay, so. You know, I'm having trouble seeing the top of my screen. But anyway, uh, let me see if I can make it a bit smaller for me. No. OK. So neoclassical macroeconomics is based on the premise that in the short run, uh, output is determined by profit maximizing utilization and full employment of the stock of labor. This is known as supply side economics because the assumption is that the labor supply adapts um, and that uh, capitalism adapts to the growth of the labor supply so as to create full employment. Keynesian macroeconomics then presents itself as the opposite because it says it is demand side. And it claims that in the short run, output, which is a utilization of capital and labor, is regulated instead by the relatively autonomous component of aggregate demand, which is autonomous consumption and investment. This is a standard textbook model. And it is uh, widely um, celebrated in the Keynesian tradition. It is noted that aggregate demand in the Keynesian tradition implies that capacity utilization and the full employment of labor, uh, full capacity utilization, full employment of labor uh, are not necessary outcomes. And this brings in the idea that the state should be and is capable of being the regulator of economic outcomes. I'm gonna talk about that later to show that why it is not capable of driving the system it is capable of affecting the system, but not capable of regulating and driving the system. What I'm calling a real economic analysis is that uh, is neither supply side or demand side. It is profit side. And that means that profit operates on both demand and supply, on their levels and their growth paths. As Keynes himself said, the engine which drives enterprise is profit. Now I can elaborate on that. I may not have time here, but I can elaborate that on the questions of how it is that profit uh, generates both demand and supply. Indeed, that is the point of view of Keynes, although it's not often appreciated. Now, I'm strongly in favor of uh, pluralism. Pluralism is a very broad tent. On the left, there's pluralism of concerns such as race, gender, class conflict, environment, inequality, economic history, history of economic thought, economic development, and even the recurrence of economic crises. And parallel to this pluralism, pluralism of concerns is a pluralism of theories institutional economics, classical economics, Marxian economics, Keynesian economics, neoclassical economics, and post-Keynesian economics. And there's a parallel also of pluralism of politics, ranging from the social democratic to the anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. These are familiar dimensions of anybody familiar with heterodox economics. Indeed, even orthodox economists, which Joe Stiglitz are quite radical, in their use of neoclassical theory, more radical than, in many cases, I think, than uh, heterodox economists. Now, though I'm strongly in favor of pluralism, I'm strongly opposed to eclecticism. What I mean by eclecticism is a tendency to pick up whatever bit of theory in from any tradition in any historical period, that'll give you the right answer. But that's not the right way to proceed. You can uh, uh, get the answer that the theory gives you, but you should not just pick out the answer you like. Uh, 
So I find that people on the left and heterodox economics can declare their opposition to the concept of economic man, so-called, in perfect competition, rational choice, and so on, and then turn around and say they develop, they uh, use game theory, production possibility curves derived from the very same foundation that one supposedly rejects. I know people who consider themselves revolutionary Marxists and yet use game theory. If you know anything about game theory, it is based on the same foundations of neoclassic economics. It's just based on uh, the interaction of individuals on a smaller scale. The other uh, tendency in eclecticism is to add e imperfections and externalities in order to explain particular observed phenomena. This is actually the dominant position, not only on the left, but within orthodoxy itself. I mean, as I said, many orthodox economists are progressive and they do so by saying that they have to add uh, imperfections and externalities. This has the advantage of speaking to economic orthodoxy on their own terms, which is politically easier and certainly wiser if you want to make a career in economics. But I've always argued that this also inevitably ties you to the orthodoxy because it is your point of reference and your point of departure. Now, I went to Catholic school, so I understand uh, the, this procedure and this history. It really says that you wish to become a good priest, but you also wish to remain within the church. I'm asking you to leave the church. To be a bad priest is not the same thing as being a good theory, theoretical and economic analysis analyst. Um, theories have an important role because they uh, determine and they have a logical structure which adds as a discipline uh, and they organize our understanding, discipline of our hopes, of our intentions, and they organize our understanding of, uh, of the world itself. They're never complete. Rather, they force us to consider how new arguments are related to the structure, new phenomena are related to the structure. If you know anything about physics, you know that this is a constant uh, understanding that you have to observe the real world, you have to explain the real world, but you cannot just add on different things that are inconsistent with the basic foundation because then you are simply being eclectic and no physics will allow you to do that, by the way. Nor can you do it in Darwin. And you should not do it in the framework derived from the classical tradition and Marx especially. It's basically an abandonment of the uh, history of, uh, of the intentions of these. And one important function of the theory is to warn us about what may or may not be likely because even if we wish it otherwise. For instance, sometimes it argued on the left that a rise in wage is not only good for workers but also good for businesses since it raises worker consumption and aggregate demand. It's a win-win situation. It's particularly common in post-Keynesian economics. Yet the very history of wage struggles is a history written in blood because of the vociferous and sometimes violent uh, resistance of businesses at the both individual and political level. That's because businesses understand that a rise in real wages is a reduction in profitability. This is an obvious point that Smith, Ricardo, and especially Marx make. And yet, surprisingly, in heterodox economics, this point is avoided. Is this because capitalists are insufficiently schooled in economics? They don't understand economic reality? Or is it because economic theories are insufficiently schooled in the oper operation of capitalism? I argue the opposite. I argue that an appropriate economics framework must understand the factors that drive capital and labor, and they must understand its empirical uh, complexity. 50% of my book is empirical evidence because I don't wish this to be, uh, I did not wish it to be simply a statement of my opinion. I wish it to be an explanation of the actual phenomena of capitalism. The goal of my work is to show I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the top of this, so let me see if I can buy the video panel. No, that doesn't work. <laughs>
Anyway, okay. So I have to periodically move this. The goal of my work is to show that there's a coherent framework which can be built into from classical Marxian and Keynesian sources, not by simply adding them together. You cannot do that. You cannot simply throw things together. You have to actually build a consistent framework. And this involves elaboration, correction, extension, all in reference to the actual patterns. I lost the video panel. Okay. And the framework must be capable of explaining many observed patterns of economic life. It's not enough to say, well, I focus on this or I focus on that. Your theory cannot choose to focus on one thing. If it is not able to focus on something, it must be developed or abandoned. And in my book, as you will see, I try to explain many different phenomena. One thing I should say is that I'm going to argue that capitalism is uh, driven by real competition. This is important because the notion of competition that the left has fallen into is the idea of neoclassical competition. Indeed, the new editors of Monthly Review openly said that their understanding of competition is that of Milton Friedman. Now, Marx, I'm sure, is rolling over in his grave if you think that competition that he was talking about is the same as Milton Friedman. I'm going to call it real competition to explain how it is different from perfect competition. As Eckhart originally said, the difference between real competition and perfect competition is the difference between war and a ballet. Here's a um, outline of the structure of my book. I apologize that the book is very long uh, because 50% of it is empirical, but also I want to show that I'm developing a framework which existed in bits and pieces in the past. Uh, I'm like an archeologist. I try to put together the structure which was broken down or not sufficiently developed. And so the first part involves foundations of the analysis. The introduction, which is a summary of the book, empirical patterns, which I call turbulent trends and hidden structures, because I want to show that capitalism has powerful patterns. And I want to show from the start that theory must address all of them. And then I talk about micro foundations and macro patterns. This is important because the theory must be able to explain how we go from individual behavior to mac uh, aggregate behavior. And that means including explaining consumer theory the same patterns, uh, downward sloping demand curves, income elasticities, uh, different ones for luxury goods and necessary goods and so on. All the observed phenomena of micro, but to derive it from without any reference whatsoever to perfect knowledge, perfect competition, uh, so-called perfect behavior of the consumer. It's in fact has to be derived from the complexity of real consumer behavior. And I often tell my students, if you want to understand how consumers behave, don't go to an economics textbook. Go to an advertising textbook because their job is to influence how uh, uh, it, uh, uh, consumers behave. And so they have to understand it. They cannot talk abstractly in a way that's convenient to the theory. The fourth chapter is about production and costs, cost curves and uh, uh, you, average cost, marginal cost curves to show you what they look like in real life. And they look nothing like those in the textbooks. Then I, I have a section on exchange money and price, particularly the history of money, going back to the earliest forms of money, which includes salt, which was very important money, uh, include hides, that is the animal hides, include shells, which were important forms of money in the Virginia and the US, tobacco, so that to understand that money is something intrinsic to exchange and it develops over time so that modern money is a specific form of money. And the last one, uh, chapter six is on capital. Capital understood as the uh, materials and money dedicated to the uh, creation and gaining of profit, what Marx calls MCM prime. 
and it's a, a brilliant formulation because it makes you understand that the purpose of throwing money into circulation and using it to buy commodities such as labor power, such as raw materials and all of that, is to make that M prime bigger than the M. Then part two goes from uh, that uh, initial foundations analysis to the theory of real competition. Now, real competition is the struggle among capitalists for market share. They set prices, they cheat, they lie. Sometimes they knock each other off. It's not legal any longer to burn down the warehouse of a competitor, but I assure you, uh, this thing happens. A mafia is a pretty fierce competitor and they do it all the time. Uh, and the theory of real competition is designed to show you how it actually works in capitalism, in modern advanced capitalism. And for that reason, I argue that the theory of monopoly capitalism, which has been uh, uh, around for since uh, Bauer and Kautsky, uh, is wrong. Since Hilferding, it's wrong. It's wrong because it starts with the idea of competition as the same as in Friedman. And of course, looking at the world, it's not like that. Then it's as an oligopoly monopoly. It's that's a trap. You have to have a theory of real competition. And I show that there is really no difference in the profit rates of small and large firms. And I'm not the inventor of this. This is a common knowledge in the business literature and they have to care about such things. That leads me to debates on perfect and imperfect competition, which is a critique of both of those. And I've sort of laid it out. And then I move to the effects of competition on relative prices. That's a very important theme from Ricardo onward. It's important in Marx, uh, prices of production in Marx, natural prices in Smith and Ricardo. And then I develop the same framework to show how you can explain finance, stock market, bond market, interest rates. In fact, I have a section of book on Schiller's theory of the stock market, which I show uh, uh, doesn't have a good foundation because it takes its point of departure from neoclassical theory. If you look at neoclassical theory, then the stock market is a mystery. But if you start from a foundation of real competition, I show that you can explain the movements of the stock market from profitability. And I, uh, if you are uh, interested in that, you should take a look at chapter 10. And the last part is chapter 11, which is to show how competition works on a world scale and how from there you can develop a theory of real exchange rates, the terms of trade. And part of what I try to show there is that the principle of international competition is the same as a principle of national competition. Firms set prices, they strive to get lower costs, lower costs gives them an advantage in getting market share and wiping out their competitors. It also forces their competitors to go look for lower costs. And so the struggle is eternal. And it also is the foundation of the struggle of capital against labor, because if you can lower the cost of labor, or you can lower the amount of labor through automation and lower costs, that is exactly what you're supposed to do. It's not a bad thing for capitalism to do that. It's a good thing. Maybe a bad thing for labor, maybe a bad thing for us, but it is actually the right thing for capitalists to do. Then part three of the book talks about turbulent dynamics. The rise and fall of modern macroeconomics, classical macroeconomics. I develop a framework for uh, classical macrodynamics. I develop, I show how that applies to the actual movements of wages and unemployment. I show how you, that can explain modern money and inflation. And then I show how these things all interact for the theory of growth, theory of profit and recurrent crisis. You know, in capitalism, there are many crises. They recur and they used to be called great depressions. But that's a number that suggests, a name that suggests that capitalism has a problem. So then they moved it to great recession. And now they're talking about the great pause. That's just a failure or an avoidance in orthodox economics of the reality that these are devastating phenomena and frequently threaten the very foundation of capitalism. Now, I want to show you two applications of my framework. I mean, I, I can only show you two because I want to stick to my promise to uh, talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, there are many other applications, as I said, stock market, international trade, uh, theory of the firm, and so on. But let me first begin 
which is a very important application uh, issue in both orthodox in, in advanced countries and developing countries. I'm going to talk about Lula's Brazil as an example of how important it is. And we know from uh, not only from Keynes, but from uh, 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 economists, especially Marx, by the way, that if you get an influx of demand, they can pump up the economy and lower unemployment. That actually happened with the discovery of gold in North America and South America and its movement through, uh, through those regions to Europe, where as Marx points out, it led to uh, a rise in prices, but it also led to great expansion of demand and production. Now, a tighter labor market raises real wages. But if wages rise faster than productivity, the wage share rises. And if the wage share rises, the profit share falls and you'll get a reduction in normal profitability. And if there's a reduction in profitability, this can reduce the growth rate. And one of the offsets for the reduction in profitability is to lower the interest rate or to raise the productivity of labor and uh, induce increase, uh, uh, induce decrease in the labor force. That is because the growth rate of capitalism is affected by the difference between the profit rate and the interest rate. And that, as I say, is an argument that Marx makes and it's an argument that Keynes makes. Let me try to explain this uh, with application to, uh, well, wait a minute, let me see if I have it also. No, let me first explain it by an application to the uh, advanced countries. We know that Keynesian policy was the dominant form of, of uh, economic thinking and policy after the post-war period. And we know that the argument there, which is an argument uh, post-Keynesians also support, is that capitalism does not automatically find uh, full capacity utilization for capital and full employment for labor. And therefore, you, the state should step in by giving a fim, uh, fiscal stimulus. And if you do that, according to orthodox Keynesian theory, then uh, you'll get more employment and you get uh, more capacity utilization. As I said, that means that it'll benefit both capital and labor. Well, this was tried, became the dominant policy in uh, the 1970s, 60s and 70s. And it immediately encountered a, a problem which could not be explained within Keynesian theory. And the problem was that uh, you began to get inflation and the slowdown in growth. And that's just not possible within Keynesian economics. And therefore the state would pump up the system more. And yes, you got more employment for a while, but then you got a slowdown in growth because the employment began, unemployment began to rise, employment fell, and you get more inflation. This was called stagflation, stagnation with inflation. And economics, uh, Keynesian economics was utterly unable to explain it. It resorted to things like the oil shock, blaming the Arabs for this, but in their own theory, this could not happen. And that's why people like Milton Friedman, Ned Phelps and others were able to literally take over economics because it was the failure of Keynesian economic theory. Now, I want to point out that if a tighter labor market raises real wages, and if wages rise faster than productivity, the wage share will rise, and this will reduce normal profitability, which will reduce the growth rate. And then, unless this is offset by lower interest rates, because growth depends on the difference between the profit rate and the interest rate, or by higher productivity growth or uh, increase of the labor force, uh, you will get a decline in growth. And that decline of growth appears to Keynesian theory to be a mystery, though I would argue that it's not a mystery to Keynes, but Keynes unfortunately died before he was able to connect his general theory to the underlying foundations. He talks about profitability as the driver of, of capitalist growth, but he doesn't develop it. Now, I want to illustrate this in two ways. As I said, one way is to illustrate it, is to show that this can explain the failure of Keynesian policies and the rise of, cap of, of uh, 
uh, stagflation. But I want to show how this problem reappears in development. The first and second Lula governments focused on the expansion of mass consumption by pro uh, providing additional income to previously excluded working families and by focusing on public and private investment in fiscal in, in infrastructure. These were great developments, great uh, 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 attempts and properly so to improve the standard of living of uh, workers and to improve the uh, level of output and production in Brazil. They use fiscal policy to fund social transfers, increases the minimum wage, increases the housing, infrastructure, health and education expenditures. As I said, these are wonderful and important in intervention. At the same time, credit was expanded to finance an increasing volume of private investment and consumer spending. The latter at subsidized low interest rates. Poverty fell. Income inequality was reduced. Unemployment fell and growth averaged a robust 4%. So this policy on the surface was a complete success. Yet, um, again, I'm having trouble seeing this. Even after the global prices, crisis of 2008, the government was able to induce a relatively fast recovery by expanding public credit and public investment and maintaining social programs. So the boom period was from 2003 to 2010. And in that, the wage share rose. Wages rose faster than productivity and the profit rate fell. Now that for me is a very important phenomenon because capitalism is driven by the profit rates. Now, lower interest rates can offset that for a while, but if the profit rate is falling, then the growth rate will fall. And over the next three years from 2011 to 2014, the growth rate fell by half from 4% to 2%. And in 2015, it went sharply negative. At the same time, the real exchange depreciated, the real exchange rate depreciated by 45% in the face of this crisis and of imposed regulations. Post Keynesians have no explanation of this because they do not link effective demand to profitability and growth in this way. They sometimes talk about profit-led growth and sometimes wage-led growth, but those seem to be options. In my argument, they're not options. If the wage share increases, the profit rate falls, and if you cannot offset that, then you have a fall in the growth rate and hence a rise in unemployment, by the way. Keynesians cannot find this in their theory, and so they have to attribute it to an external shock in international prices in raw materials prices, because there's nothing within the theory that can explain these phenomena internally. I, I hope you understand that I'm a fan of Lula's and I look forward to the return of that kind of regime to Brazil. But I also want to argue that you need to understand what the consequences are when you propose a policy. I was told that in the olden days, there would be astrologers who would uh, make predictions and uh, for the king and so on. But if the predictions were not correct, the punishment could be draconian, including death. Now, economists don't have that feedback mechanism. We can make predictions. We can be wrong. Uh, many examples of shock therapy, for instance, in Russia, uh, uh, applied by the neoclassicals of uh, shock theory of, of applied in uh, Latin America, of uh, the Chicago school variety. And uh, uh, there is no penalty. Unlike the old days when the king could hang an astrologer for being wrong, economists just move on to another topic. Nonetheless, the penalty is for those people who are subject to those theories. And if you're going to be an economist, doing policy, you must take that seriously. You cannot say, oh, I was wrong, I will retire to my house and uh, simply avoid the issue. Piketty correctly notes that profit making neither knows limits nor uh, uh, morality. That's an important point. Profit is driven for forever to keep expanding, keep expanding. Elon Musk wants to expand profit 
to Mars. He's just embodying the standard and long-standing assumption that you need to go where you need to go to make profits. Capitalism's efficiency consists of creating profit opportunities and cashing them in. It has created great wealth over the long run, but also great inequality and great misery in many parts of the world. It drives the absorption of some workers through growth and also the displacement of other workers through mechanization. It creates cancer-curing drugs as well as the production of cancer-causing commodities. I hope there are no smokers in this conference, so you know both sides of this. It creates heroin production and sale, not legal, but now marijuana is legal. It creates pornography, sex trafficking, which are well-organized and highly, highly profitable global activities. It creates the dumping of toxins because that saves money to capitalists. And then it gets, gets paid for cleaning them up. As Mark says, profit is on both sides of the coin. It creates these opportunities and also creates these terrible consequences. None of the arguments I make about real competition of how firms operate, how consumers operate, depend on so-called rational choice or the various complicated, various bevy of perfect behaviors and optimal outcomes. There is no need to attribute actual outcomes to deviations from some kind of Edenic state, a kind of biblical state arising from imperfections of various sorts. Because when you speak about imperfection, you must be speaking about perfection. There is no imperfection without perfection. And I argue that one must abandon both and move to a framework in which the real outcomes are natural and normal, whether we like them or not. So this brings me back to the main theory of my argument in favor of a coherent framework. When economists propose policies that do not work out, the penalty is borne by those who suffer the consequences. So it is our responsibility, indeed our main uh, uh, concern, that we, our proposals are both theoretically and empirically grounded. So to come back to my original point, I've tried to argue in favor of pluralism, which is the investigation of many different topics. And in my own work, I've done it on development, my more recent work in inequality by race, class, and gender, uh, using tools that are necessary for that. I want to say a little bit about the fact of tools. Mathematics is a tool which can be used for the appropriate question. It's not some kind of magic bulletin. It's not some kind of magic device. And using mathematics for theories that are bad is bad mathematics. Mathematics cannot give you more than one you put into it. And it is a beautiful set of propositions, but not all of them are applicable to real phenomena. I've had in, in my framework, in my theoretical framework, recourse to nonlinear dynamics because you're talking about real capitalism, which is moving and nonlinear and very dynamic and turbulent. And that you can do within certain uh, theoretical frameworks. I've also had use of econophysics, and I can talk more about that, which is the explanation, which is uh, a very powerful means of explaining patterns of inequality. Inequality by race, class, and gender, as I mentioned, but also inequality across the whole world. I have a paper uh, with Amr Raghab, uh, co-author, which has been rejected by every journal for 10 years because they keep saying that this is not what normal economists do. Well, yes, I admit I'm not a normal economist. I don't want to be a normal economist. I want to be an economist who understands the real process. So I hope in your own thinking, you will consider this possibility of moving to a framework that's coherent and empirically grounded and moving away from just picking up a piece of post-Keynesian economics, a piece of neoclassic economics, a piece of imperfections of various sorts and cobbling it together to get the answer you want. You cannot, in my opinion, approach 
uh, the real world by saying that your outcome or your uh, result should be progressive. Your results should be real. And if you want outcomes that are progressive, as Lula did, then you're responsible for understanding how to use the tools of economics to bring those out, including understanding how some of them will not work. This is for me a very important uh, thing to say that uh, a coherent framework should tell you what you cannot do. You cannot just say, I don't like the law of gravity, so I'm going to jump off this building. It's highly non-recommended because the law of gravity is a law imposed on all of us. It doesn't mean we can't fly. It doesn't mean we can't go to outer space. We cannot do those things if you ignore the law of gravity. In that sense, capitalism has many laws of gravity. Indeed, Marx used to call them the laws of motion of capitalism. And uh, Ricardo calls them the laws of economic, uh, uh, economic laws of capitalism. Smith does too, the invisible hand. Uh, I argue, I'm trying to argue that uh, you should consider the possibility in your own work, in your theoretical and empirical and policy work, that the advantage of a coherent foundation is that you can see what will work and what may not work, and what you can do about what may not work. Now, I promised the kites I would end in 45 minutes, and this is 45 minutes. So I will stop there and open it up for discussion. Thanks, Ambar. It's quite difficult to discuss with you, so I will try to, to, get, to offer you some questions to differentiate your positions from those of other economists. Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, you participated a few years ago in an event with Thomas Piketty, where you pointed out some limits on, on his theory. One of those was his analysis of bread tax income. The other was that he relies, or he reifies political institutions to fix the problem of the capitalist class. And you argue that it's the very same political institutions, the one that generates those dynamics. So can you briefly expose uh, your critique of Piketty, especially the one that you put in the last chapters of your book? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I mentioned econophysics, and this is very important. And a physicist by the name of Viktor Yakovenko decided to study uh, inequality. And... Uh, I can't show it here, I wish I had prepared it, but if you look at inequality, and this is data from the Internal Revenue Service to the United States, so it's not made up to serve any particular purpose, you will see a pattern of inequality. What uh, Yakovenko showed is that the pattern can be broken into two parts. One part is a uh, exponential curve, which applies essentially to those who have labor income, and the other part is a uh, what's called a power law, a Pareto law, which was actually discovered in the 1898 by Pareto. And that is a very different pattern. And what Yakovenko says is, well, that's because wages have a different role, a different pattern from profits. I asked Victor once, how did you think about thinking about this income in two terms? And he said, you must be joking. I grew up in Russia. And the one thing I knew about capitalism is that it has two classes. So he showed how to apply the theory to this, how to join the two parts together and have a general uh, theoretical structure from, and that's why it's called econophysics. I was able to use that to not only uh, explain patterns uh, of race, class, and gender. And by the way, all of my papers are on my homepage, uh, which I think is called realecon.org. Um, and uh, I, so what I'm talking about is available there to everybody. I also want to mention that in my book, I said I had a lot of empirical evidence in the book. <laughs> All the empirical data in the book is available on my book webpage, which is the end of, at the end of my email. Um, and that means that you have access to all the spreadsheets all the raw data, and you can see how it's developed and how it can be extended. Well, Piketty's work is great. Not only Piketty, but Saez, uh, uh, 
on inequality. It shows these amazing patterns. It shows them over time. It shows them by income class at the top of 10%, top 1%. Uh, and I think that's all great. The question is, what ties this theory together? What is the foundation of these patterns? And I've argued that these are normal and natural patterns when capitalism is let loose. I don't think Piketty would disagree with that. Then the question is, what do you do about it? A wealth tax? Well, maybe. But to do the wealth tax, you have to convince capitalists that you can do it. And they have a tremendous resistance to it. Recently, it was mentioned that Elon Musk paid taxes of 3.5%. That makes me 10 times more paying more taxes than Elon Musk because he has many loopholes. And how does that happen? It happens because the state is dependent heavily on the capitalist class for its possibilities. The very notion of an independent state is a fiction. There is possible struggle over where the state is going to go. That's an important history of capitalism. But it doesn't mean that the state is neutral. So one of my concerns about him is precisely this political idea that you can regulate capitalism in some way uh, in a, by wealth taxes or some other uh, international uh, global phenomena, because I just don't think that's possible. I don't think it's going to be permitted. Uh, and certainly if it is permitted, it would take more than a policy prescription. It would take a global struggle. Um, Yes, does that answer roughly your question? Yeah, it does. In this conference, I mean, it's about the heterodox economist. You are quite the most prominent ones, but here are, we have heard uh, several references to development theories. Uh, about you were very critical in a recent interview with Jacobin, in which you related it or you connected it to the Mars School of monopoly from Marana and Suisi that you also uh, discussed previously. Uh, quoting Marx, uh, here for a phrase of you that is quite interesting, the development of the means of production that does not mean that there is appearance of competition, but it's an it's intensification, but between larger capitals. You also told that we need cor correct analysis to develop good policies. And now that Lula is coming, could you please express which are the limits of development theories that you also <laughs> pursue during his time? Uh, well, let me start with the last one. I do not presume <laughs> to give Lula advice because I never talk about something unless I've studied in great detail. And even though I have studied development policies, I use Lula's regime as an example. I would not say that I'm competent to talk about the, the real uh, uh, issues involved, not because I think I'm not able to do it intellectually, it's because I haven't done the work. And to talk about something as concrete as that and whose lives depend on, on people's lives depend, depend on it, I could only offer advice to those who are on the ground and uh, perhaps that will come about. But at the moment, all I can say is what I tried to argue about Lula's regime is that you have to avoid certain things. If you want to achieve what you want to do, then you have to avoid the consequences which will undermine it. And that is what theory is about. Theory is not about tell, telling you what you like. Theory is about telling you what's possible. And sometimes what you wish most of all is not possible. Uh, this leads me to this idea of monopoly theory. Marxist theory has been dominated by the idea of monopoly capitalism and finance capitalism. I think both of them are completely wrong. These come from first uh, Bauer and Kautsky at the end in the uh, end of the 19th century, and then it's picked up by Hilfiding in his book on finance capital, and then it's picked up by Lenin. And after Lenin, virtually every school of Marxism talks about capitalism is monopoly. I asked Paul Sweezy once, what is competition if you're going to speak of monopoly capitalism? And he said, well, competition is what I learned at Harvard. It's uh, uh, orthodox economics, competition. 
I would argue that is such a horrendous mistake. Poor Marx, poor Marx, that he's reduced to an early form of Friedman. He has a very precise, very detailed analysis of conflict, class and interclass conflict of uh, uh, competition. And I've tried to lay that out in my book. I've tried to show the patterns it can explain. And therefore, I argue that you should not rely on comp uh, monopoly theory for two reasons. I think it's completely wrong. But it also gives a false power to uh, the capitalists. Yes, of course, they'd like to plan capitalism, though, except for the fact that they hate each other and would like to kill each other off. That's a small detail. They don't sit in a small room and talk about how they want to run the world. They sit in small rooms and talk about how they want to kill the other capitalists. And that's their job. That is a proper job. Therefore, the whole idea that monopoly capitalism is sort of run by power, I think is false. The power that runs monopoly capitalism, oops, hang on a second, my, I don't want my battery to die, I forgot. The power of monopoly capitalism, uh, I'm sorry, the power of capitalism is the power of the market, of profit. And that is a power over capital. That's a very important point. Is not a power that capital controls. Capital, of course, intervenes, but it's a power over capital. That's why capitalists go bankrupt. That's why whole forms of production are wiped out. That's why whole countries cannot enter into the world market because the market is regulated by profitability and no individual capitalist or set of capitalists determines that. I show in my book, for instance, that there is no difference in the profit rates of larger capitals and smaller capitals. Indeed, small, uh, larger capitals have lower profit rates, but they have lower risk. So if you adjust for risk, their profit rates are essentially the same. And this is not my finding. This is a finding in the business literature. And it's greatly important to them to be able to understand how uh, capitalism works. So dependency theory. I have great respect for the people involved in dependency theory. I, I know, I knew some of them. I met some of them which tells you how old I am. Uh, and I believe that the project of understanding the impact of developed capitalism on uh, developing countries is the, the fundamental project. But I think that they fell for certain important uh, 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 notions, which are false. I've already talked about monopoly capitalism. So let me talk about a different one. In David Ricardo, the theory of rent tells you, or seems to tell you, that as capitalism expands, it moves to less and less productive lands. And as it does, then the cost of uh, agricultural goods will rise relative to the cost of uh, industrial goods because industrial goods and agricultural goods both have technical change. But agricultural goods have this declining fertility of land. So therefore, agricultural goods will rise faster in price uh, to uh, then uh, industrial goods. That is to say the terms of trade between agriculture and industry will move towards agriculture. Now what the dependency school emphasizes, and especially Prebish and others, is that the terms of trade do not move towards agriculture. On the contrary, the agricultural goods prices decline relative to industrial goods. And that they seem to think comes from the fact that industrial goods come from the advanced countries and though therefore it's an indication of monopoly power. Well, it's interesting to note that Marx criticizes Ricardo for this argument. He said, this is not simply true. Capitalists don't just move to less and less productive lands, they create more productive lands through fertilization, through technical change, through movements across the world so that they come to places where the agricultural goods are cheaper. And he argues that, in fact, agricultural goods are subject to the same laws as capitalist, as industrial goods. So that wipes out the whole premise of dependency theory, which is coming from Ricardo, ironically, not from Marx, who uh, argues, and there's a letter, uh, I didn't show it in my book, from Marx to Engels. Uh, Marx calls Engels Fred. And he says, dear Fred, I've been reading about uh, uh, 
Adam Smith and Ricardo. And he says the empirical evidence does not support it. And then Marx says a very, very important thing. Marx is the greatest theorist of economics ever was. He says, when it comes to theory versus the empirical evidence, I always on, on the side of the empirical evidence. He's a scientist. And so was Ricardo and so was Smith. The empirical evidence ask, tells you what you have to understand. And if your theory doesn't understand it, you have to understand what's wrong with the theory. And this is what Marx is proposing to Engels. So as I said, I have the greatest respect and admiration for the dependency school. I understand the motivation of the monopoly school, but I think that especially in the monopoly school, there's a really fundamental error and that error has damaged Marxism and indeed damaged the economic analysis of capitalism. I realize that may not be a popular position, but I can say for a fact that my theory was never driven by the idea of being popular. I think that one of the realms or one of the places where this critique or this theory of monopoly capital is super present is in the tech industry. Uh, regula regulators in both parts of the Atlantic, both in the United States and the European Union, are like obsessed with taming big tech companies. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we learn from various authors is, uh, you also discuss a lot about externalities. Uh, what, one of the things that we learned is that capitalist always uh, displays cost to us work. Can be, can be the, in the earth or can be the user. Is there anything, any kind of dynamic that you observe it in the tech industry, in Amazon, Google, and, and the likes, that explains something that is not present in your book, or that explains something that you didn't manage to conceptualize, and just think that we have a lot of authors talking about surveillance capitalism, cognitive capitalism, that they are like obsessed with the surname, but they don't understand capitalism. We have Barufakis and a lot of people talking about feudalism. It appears that we enter a new, era where capitalism is no longer operating, which is your understanding? Because I didn't hear a lot about your analysis of the tech industry and I would love to ask you about this. First of all, the key argument I make throughout the book is that large scale does not imply the uh, reduction of competition. It is a means to the intensification of competition. That's why large scale firms don't have higher profit rates. Indeed, as you know, Amazon and uh, Tesla and Uber lost, lost a lot of money for a long period of time. Why would they do that? Because they don't understand that large scale is money losing? No, because they understand that the way you win is to use your large scale to break into markets. And that has always been the history of capitalism, always that large scale gives you the advantage of lower costs. Lower costs gives you the advantage of beating your competitors and driving them out. And then when you take the market, then you get the profits that you uh, deserve, so to speak. Marx actually calls this process concentration and centralization, not as a phenomenon of monopoly, but in fact, an intrinsic phenomena of competition. So I have actually looked at these things, but I didn't do it in the book. The book is 1,011 pages, and my publisher would have me executed if I'd gone any further. Um, but I think it's fairly easy to argue this because it applies even to small scale. People forget this. When you start a business, you start small scale. Well, why would you start a business? Because you want to get part of the market share. Well, how do you get market share? You get market share by offering something that others don't. Now, small, you know, grocery stores and all that, they're local. But if you want to go national or international, then you have to have lower costs. And lower costs come from going to where there's cheaper labor. Lower costs come from where there's uh, cheaper raw materials. And lower costs comes from larger scale because larger scale allows you to reduce costs. So these are the necessary patterns of what I call real competition. I'm not surprised by that. On the contrary, I'm absolutely uh, uh, confident that these are normal patterns. Let me just say one other word. You use the word externality. Now, 
I want to argue that there's no such thing as an externality. The very notion of externality is built on the neoclassical idea that some things are internal and some things are external. I argue that everything is an internality. Yes, there are external things. And one of the comets coming out of outer space lands on us, definitely, that's an externality. The state acts in some ways that outside the interests of capital, though mostly in, a, in the United States it does not. But I would argue that one should reject the notion of an externality because that's based on either the neoclassical theory of the consumer or the neoclassical theory of the firm. Consider the con consumer. If you take a textbook, I use Varian as an example, but there may be there are newer textbooks. Varian it doesn't even come to the concept of externality till page 287. All the rest is this absurd framework in which uh, only good things are internal and bad things are external. But that makes no sense to me. The, the same people who produce uh, uh, commodities that we use also produce the degradation of the environment. That's not an externality. Both are internality. So I argue, I would argue that one should reject terms like that because they're traps. Instead, think of what is two sides of the same process. And from that point of view, they're internalities. Both of them are internalities. And we're trying to connect your ideas to the current state of the global economy. Uh, there's a big discussion on inflation uh, in your book. This is like a keyword to which you oppose it, the profitability of the firms. And you also have a wide critique on modern monetary theory. And you displayed it very recently on a, on a discussion with Stephanie Calton where you saw it, your position, uh, talking with some of the scholars working in Spain on, on modern monetary theory and the, and the group that in, in Spain is, is working on, on that area, they told me that your critique is a bit uh, orthodox and it's also drawing on, on neoclassical theory. So I, I would like to hear your critique on, on modern monetary theory and, and your alternative framework, at least a synthesis of it. Okay, so uh, let me first talk about inflation. Right, because that's very important to the critique of modern, modern monetary theory. I argue that uh, one of the key contributions of Keynes about inflation is to say that inflation involves a pull on demand. This is actually Milton Friedman also, by the way. And that pull on demand can cause certain things. Now, Milton Friedman says, well, capitalism is mostly at full employment. So if you pull on demand by uh, increasing the money supply, or in Keynes's case, by running de fiscal deficits, then you'll get inflation because you're already at full employment. Keynes says, no, 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 that's not true. Look around you. Look at what happened in 1920s. Look at 1930s. Look what's happening in, in the post-war period. You don't have full employment. And if you don't have full employment, then the state has room to step in. Okay, so that part is correct. You step in and you pump up the system through injecting purchasing power. And they, I, I show in the book how to actually calculate that using the IMF figures uh, of various sorts. But if you inject purchasing power, then the question is, when does that injection lead to growth as opposed to inflation? I mean, that's a fundamental question of the supply constraint. Orthodox economics and Keynesian economics and MMT economics says that that limit is when you have full employment. I argue actually following Marx that there is no such thing as full employment. Capitalism is perfectly capable of importing labor. I mean, the whole history of advanced capitalism is a history of immigration, of people coming in to uh, supply labor that capital needs and also being blocked when the capital doesn't need them. It's true in Germany, true in the United States, it's true in Australia, it's really true in all capitalist countries. Well, if that's the case, that the labor supply is endogenous because you can open the gates of the uh, uh, entry into the country or you can narrow the gates or you can close the gates, then the labor supply is not the limit. If it's not the limit, then how do we get inflation? I point out that Ricardo and Marx make a completely different argument. Also von Neumann makes that same argument. 
And that argument is that the limit to growth is when the surplus is fully invested. That's an abstract limit. It's not meant to be a concrete limit. It's a theoretical limit. But if surplus value is all fed back, then the growth of the system is the maximum because you're feeding back all of the increase, all the profit. Now, uh, as I point out, that, that doesn't mean that you have to observe that. What you need to know is how far you are from this limit. And I therefore develop the equivalent of a unemployment measure or capacity utilization measure, which is this growth utilization measure. And that's really from Ricardo and Marx and von Neumann. That means I can explain the limits on supply from the closeness of the growth rate to the profit rate, because the profit rate is a maximum growth rate, as von Neumann points out, as Marx also points out, and Ricardo points out. And the closer the actual growth rates to the maximum growth rate, the greater the resistance of supply. My teacher, uh, Luigi Passanetti, develops this argument in his book and shows that the closer you get to those limits, the more you have supply constraints uh, in different industries. Now, that for me allows you to explain inflation by combining the demand side, which is the Keynesian and many other MMT post-Keynesian arguments with a different explanation of the limit. And this is non-trivial because if you look at full employment as the limit, you find that the theory of inflation does not work does not work at all. And then this is very well known. Keynesians have been struggling with this for a long time. Well, so what's the contribution of MMT? The contribution of MMT is to focus on fiat money, fiat money. Uh, I told you I have a chapter in my book about the history of money, beginning from the very beginning, uh, shells and tobacco leaves and all that. And the capitalism comes at some point where money is fiat money. That is to say, it's not backed by anything officially not backed by anything. Uh, and therefore, the state in principle can issue as much as it needs. And indeed, it can withdraw as much as it needs. That is not new. I, I have friends who are MMT people. In fact, all the MMT people, I know all of them fairly well. But as I point out in my book, this is an argument made by monetarists. I mentioned the book itself in which they make exactly the same argument. The state puts in money into one area, and then it draws that money out to spend it. And then it has to either put that money back when it gets it back in taxes or it has to refill that area. That is their argument. And it's long before MMT, long before MMT. I think that's correct. Clearly, that's how uh, um, fiat money works. But what I think is wrong is the theory of inflation. Now, some MMT people say, well, we're post Keynesians, inflation comes about because prices are determined from wages and costs, but costs are simply the prices of other commodities. So ultimately, the wage is the regulator price. That's Kaletsky. Anybody who's read Kaletsky knows that's exactly what Kaletsky ends up saying. I think that's wrong. Uh, they do it by saying there's a fixed markup on costs. So then they end up with the idea that the only real way to talk about uh, uh, inflation is either wage money wage increases or import goods. And I mentioned that already in talking about the arguments uh, of uh, 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 post-Keynesian economists uh, in, uh, about Lula. It's uh, uh, external to capitalism. Uh, and then they argue, well, if you just control the wage properly, then you won't have inflation. I think this is completely wrong. And I try to argue in my book why inflation has a very different phenomena. And I do it not only for the advanced countries, I do it for developed countries. I show that you can explain inflation by the degree to which credit expands uh, relative to the possibilities of supply. Uh, the question then for me is not MMT. The question is the implications of MMT for uh, capitalism itself. And that leads to the question of how fiscal policy or monetary policy affects capitalism. I've already said one important way that it can improve the growth rate, which is lowering the interest rate. But they already have done that. 
in every advanced country, the interest rate is about as low as it can go. So that part has been used up. Then everything depends on profitability for me. And effective demand, uh, I would argue, in Keynes is regulated by profitability too. I can elaborate on this, but anyway, that at least lays out some of the lines of division. I will pose you two more questions. Uh, one of those is super related to the status of the global economy again. Uh, after the pandemic, we have seen a revival of Keynesian arguments uh, here in very easily in Spain. We have seen both of the parties in the government praising the return of Keynes, the return of the centrality of the state. Outside of Spain, we have seen a, a huge debate about the end of neoliberalism. Uh, and then the, the Ukrainian and economic crisis attached to it came, and we have seen a big investment in the military sector. Are we seeing uh, a return of, on Keynes? Are we seeing a return of austerity because governments don't have enough gas because we have this kind of ne next generation funds which are quite reliant, which, which rely uh, enormously on public-private partnership that, as Daniel Agabor points out, it's like another kind of austerity, which is your point of view on this? Well, it, it depends, first of all, on which country. Uh, in there is, in the United States, there is no uh, public-private uh, alliance to help labor to help the poor, except when they threaten the system. You know, uh, current inflation in the COVID era is driven by the fact that the supply chains have collapsed or reduced greatly. And that means that normally incomes would go down because unemployment would go up. But the states everywhere have quite properly recognized if they allow that to happen, they would have a revolt. And so they have tried to support the purchasing power of the middle class and of the uh, working class by giving various uh, subsidies and various uh, grants to those to keep them up. So what you have is a tremendous decrease in supply because of the uh, collapse of the supply chain. And you have not equivalent decrease in demand. Well, that leads to inflation. And it's a damn good thing it does, because if it didn't, it would lead to pover increased poverty and misery than we already have. Uh, so I don't think it's very difficult to explain inflation. What is going to be difficult is to explain how to revive the, uh, the supply chain. And that comes about because all the different countries in that chain have to be able to be revived and each one depends on the other. Uh, the whole notion of supply chain is that the weakest link affects the whole chain. And the weakest link in different places or different goods, but it's very clear. So I, I am all in favor of this public-private partnership, even though I don't see very much in the United States. And I understand that there'll be resistance from the capitalists, but they should be a push from labor. And I hope that it goes in the right direction. But as I've said many times, you need to know what the consequences are for profitability, what the consequences are for inflation, and you have to be prepared to deal with those consequences. If you don't, then that alliance will fall apart, as it has many other times in history. I don't know if that answers all of your questions, but oh, the revival of Keynesian economics. You know, I think if you think that Keynesian economics was displaced by bad guys, new liberals, Friedman and others, you know, uh, Lucas, then Keynesian economics was essentially correct and it was politically displaced. And then you should bring it back. Yes. But I argue that it was in economically incorrect, an economic fatal flaw. And bringing it back will bring back the flaw unless you make sure that you keep within the limits of the system. Uh, and that limit is that wages cannot rise faster than productivity for any extended length of time because it has an impact on the profit rate. And the capitalists are not indifferent to this impact. And the state is not a state of the system. It's a state of capital and labor, mostly capital. 
So I don't see that this is going to solve the problem in itself, though it may improve uh, absolutely clear the welfare state improved the standard of living of workers. How did that happen? Because workers took up arms against uh, low wages, against long working hours, against the horrible conditions of misery. And the state was a reaction to that to save the system. I often make the point that uh, Jack Ma was the biggest industrial capitalist in the world, I think, but certainly in China, has a phrase called uh, 996. And what does 996 mean? He says that is the only viable working uh, principle from nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night, six days a week. So 12 hours a day, six days a week, 72 hours. And this is in fact the norm in the early history of capitalism. Read again Engels on the conditions of working class. Read about how workers struggled to bring the working day down from 72 hours to 65 hours, how they struggled to get child labor out the process, how they struggled to protect uh, workers from injuries and miseries and arbitrary firing and all of that. Well, how did that happen? It happened through the organization and struggle against the natural tendencies of capitalism. And you will not do away from the natural tendencies by simply saying, I want you to be nice to labor. That's not how it works. You have to, labor has to say, we don't permit this. We fight against it. And labor in the United States is in a very weak condition, extremely weak, but it's reviving. And I'm all in favor of that, but I don't think this means that you can do away with neoliberalism in itself. It'll be a much harder struggle. During, and this is the last question, during the pandemic, uh, for sustaining your argument on turbulent, turbulent regulation, uh, you did two very interesting lectures on Marx and Hayek, in which you argue that both of them have similar positions on this issue. And obviously, <laughs> you favor the analysis of Marx, but uh, obviously, but I would like to hear a bit the difference between Mar well, the similarities. Well, let me no, let me talk about the similarities first, because I think people don't know the similarities. And which one do you prefer, and why? <laughs> well, there, I wrote up. I mean, I have a whole paper on it, uh, mm -hmm. and I can share it. But uh, they're both uh, highly critical of how capitalism works, in the sense that they're both aware of its tendencies. Hayek says, you know, capitalism does not reward the most educated, the best students, the best uh, uh, people. On the contrary, many of the people it rewards are bad people. But that is the strength of capitalism, he says, because the reward is determined by the market, not by arbitrary rules of uh, who's good or bad. Well, can you imagine Marx disagreeing with that? Marx says stronger things than that, but he definitely says that capitalism does not reward the good and the, and the deserving. On the contrary, the whole point of the struggle against capitalism, the working class is deserving, but is not rewarded in the same way. I, I list a whole series of things uh, 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 about capitalism that Marx shares. Um, the idea that capitalism works through trial and error. That's what I call turbulent uh, uh, processes. That's shared by Engels, by, by Marx and Hayek. The idea that uh, uh, the market is the regulator of the system, not the capitalist class. I already mentioned that about monopoly and so on. That's shared by Marx and Hayek. There's a long, long list of these things that I, I put in that paper. And the reason I do that is that one fundamental thing they don't share, and this is actually quite obvious, is whether you should continue capitalism or you should overthrow capitalism. They share the critique, but Hayek says, look, this is the best of all possible systems because it didn't arise from any planning or individual decisions. It arrives organically from history. And you cannot do any better, even though it has many bad properties. Those bad properties are aspects of its good properties. Marx agrees with that, that idea that bad properties and good properties go 
together. But then he says, well, we can certainly imagine a better social system. We can certainly imagine socialism in some form. And this is their point of departure. The interesting thing is that so many points of agreement. And I think people need to read Hayek more carefully to understand what he actually said. He believed that uh, fascism in Chile was a good thing. So later he tried to back away from that. But we know he said that because he said it. Why is it a good thing? Because you have to fight against any attempt to overthrow the best of all possible systems. And to fight against that, you have to use force sometimes. Hayek sometimes said, well, okay, you need to pay, you need to keep the working class uh, in a certain standard living, because if you don't, then you will have a problem with capitalism. Not because he cares about the working class, because he cares about the capitalist class. Well, Marx doesn't argue that. He argues that the working class should fight for its standard living and fight for the overthrow of capital. These are somewhat obvious differences. What I tried to emphasize is the in surprising number of similarities in their concrete analysis. Marx, by the way, it wasn't around to talk about neoclassical economics, but Hayek was, and he thinks it's absolute nonsense. All this stuff of perfect competition, or he said, that's ridiculous. That's not how capitalism operates. And therefore, once again, I have to say, I agree with Hayek and Marx. Well, we will be ready for sure to, to have that battle, <laughs> yes. which form we'll take. But for now, I hope that this conference and the World Seminar help people to understand development and cooperation in a more radical or at least a heterodox approach. Every conference uh, will be distributed as a single entity, so everyone uh, will be able to check it. And well, thanks for everyone for joining uh, in all the channels that we distributed this conference. And obviously thanks Anwar for, for your time, for your thoughts. And hopefully we will be reading your, your translation of this thick book soon in Spanish. Well, I, I want to mention that I have a contract to cut the book back to 300 pages. <laughs> So uh, it is now 1011, and a lot of people faint when they even I mention that. But I had to show that I was dealing with all the other schools of thought also and the empirical evidence. I can condense that and put it online, and therefore my goal is to reduce it around 300 pages. And then the second goal, which I will then begin afterwards, is to make a textbook so that hopefully people will have a way to teach the stuff that's accessible. Uh, to uh, undergraduate students and graduate students. That will be perfect, helpful, at least in Spain, where Orthodox theories are everywhere. <laughs> Many well, in Chile also, <laughs> Orthodox theory, and in China, yeah. and in Europe, and France, and Italy, and certainly the United States, Orthodox theory dominates, actually controls all schools of thought. But uh, that doesn't mean we have to accept that. You did a, a very good work on that, so thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank